Thank you, Micah, and uh, the crew. <clears throat> cool to see the, uh, we had somebody from Shiloh, Shiloh Community, is that what it was? Shiloh, Shiloh Community Church, you know, a couple from Shiloh Community come over here. We have uh, our, one of our Pastor Will Hess, he's down in another church down in Door. He's preaching this morning, so it's people going everywhere. Uh, it's neat to see the body of Christ at work supporting each other, which is cool. So, uh, We are continuing on in our series in 1 Peter. So if you wouldn't mind grabbing your Bibles, pulling that out. Hopefully this... Uh, it worked. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter, actually if you want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 8. For those of you who may be new here, my name is Pastor John Lauder. and been a part of Frontline for a lot of years now. And uh, it truly is a privilege for me to be a part of this church. And uh, one, of the, one of my greatest joys as being a part of this church is the fact that uh, we preach the word here. And it's, in fact, it's one of our core values to embed the Bible in all that we do. It's, uh, it's, this is the book that is authoritative. There's all sorts of opinions out there, but this is the book by which we get our authority. I, I have authority as I speak because I speak from the Word of God. It's just not me. I, yes, I'm a likable enough guy, but I don't speak with enough authority to say, you need to do this. It's the Word of God that speaks with the authority. So, with that being said, we've come to a fun passage today, um, but we're going to start with verse 8. If you can read there along with me, verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 3, says this, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attended to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Even if we look back at verse 12 there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. It says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. The perspective that we get here is that if you're going to live as a Christian, everybody's going to love you. I mean, that's what you're getting here in this. You know, I mean, seriously, who wouldn't want to be around people who love each other? They're in harmony with one another. Um, they, they love each other as brothers. They're compassionate towards each other. They're humble. When somebody curses them, they turn around and bless them. I mean, talk about a great group of people to be around, isn't it? I mean, this passage is like guaranteed if you do these things, everybody is going to love you and want to be around you. But Peter raises a question in verse 13 of chapter 3. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? In other words, if this is your goal, to live this way, to be that sort of a thing, who's going to harm you? Nobody's going to want to do that. But, verse 14, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Oh, no. He just said that I may suffer if I do these sort of things. Why? Why? I want you to turn, keep your fingers in 1 Peter, because our passage is 13 through 22. So keep your finger there, put one of these little um, marker things there if you got one. And I want you to turn with me to John chapter 3, verse 19. <clears throat> John 3 is most famous because of verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's why John 3 is so famous. But there's some other great verses that are also in John chapter 3. And I love these three here, John 3, 19 through 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his or her deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through Christ. Okay? In other words, Jesus is the light of the world. 
the world, oftentimes, the sin of the world, whatever, is spoken of as darkness in the world. And so you've got light and darkness as the two opposites. Jesus is the light of the world. And so when Jesus came in, it's like he turned the lights on. But as the text tells us, the problem is, is there are those who are in the world who don't want the light. In fact, they actually want to repel the light. You know, all, you all know what this is like, okay? You're, it's, you're sound asleep, you're enjoying some sleep, and it's dark in your room, and somebody walks into the room, and what do they do? Turn the lights on, and what's your reaction? Thank you for the light. Thank you, I couldn't see anything. My eyes were closed, and I was sleeping, and now I can see it. No, what is your reaction when the light gets turned on? Turn the crazy light off, or whatever else you would say, right? Why? Because our eyes are not adjusted. We, we're, we're used to the darkness at that point in time. In fact, when somebody turns the light on, even though they may have done it with the best of intentions, the simple presence of the light will make some people run the other direction. Not only that, but what happens when the light represents the exact opposite of what this person or people believe, want to practice whatever else. Can you imagine if you are that light and you're walking in, Jesus is the light of the world and he's shining his light through you. Philippians tells us that we, are, we shine like lights in the universe. That's what we do as followers of Jesus Christ. So no matter where I go, I am the light if I'm truly representing Christ. I may have the best of intentions when I go to somebody else and I may go to them and be, be the Christian. I'm going to, hey, listen, I'm going to be harmonious. I'm going to love you. I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be all those things. Hi, I'm a Christian. And they go, you're what? That's about, I mean, so it can be hard to understand this, except if we put it in modern terms. What would happen if I come to you and I say, you've never met me before, but I say, hi, I'm John. I'm from the IRS. I may be a nice enough person, I may be a perfectly wonderful person to be around, but simply the group that I represent may turn you off from that. It may have nothing to do with me, it's simply who I represent. And that's what Peter's getting at here, that's what John was getting at here. In the world, if you want to be a follower of me, be prepared In fact, Jesus even said, he says, if they hate you, remember, they hated me first. If you're going to be a follower of me, be prepared. Some people will not like you. I'm entitled my message this morning, Contingency Plans, because we're kind of soft as Christians, aren't we? I think we're kind of soft. If things don't go well in our Christian life, if things don't go as planned, you know, if I do this, if I do that, if I do this, everybody's going to like me. Everybody's going to, I'm going to tell them about Jesus. They're going to want to know Jesus, right? No, not so much. So how can I live as a Christian in a world in which there will be those which we're going to talk about here in 1 Peter, there will be those who are going to love it. They're going to be drawn like, in, like a moth to a flame. They're going to be drawn to the compassion and the humility that we exhibit as believers in Jesus Christ. Like I said, when somebody curses us, I hate you because you're a Christian. I hate you because of this, whatever else. And when we turn that curse around, and rather than cursing them back, we bless them. We're kind to them. We love them just the way they are. Whatever the situation is, But what happens if that plan doesn't convince them right away? How do we handle it? We need some contingency plans. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And so my, kind of the main theme is, I want us to be prepared. You know, we talked about it, it matters that we live as a Christian. That was what we talked about last week. It does matter. Because the things that we're doing about compassion and humility and all those things, it does matter. But if I think that because it matters and I tried it today and I tried it tomorrow maybe, but everybody's going to turn and go, I'm so glad you're doing this. We're sorely mistaken. Therefore, we need to be prepared in order to be able to truly 
live and to keep living as a Christian in a world that doesn't want this. Here's what I'm seeing in our world. I'm seeing this among Christians. I'm seeing a lot of Christians who, who go to either extreme. The one extreme is that the, the more the world pushes back, the more we dig our heels in. I'm going to represent Christ, and I don't care how many people I tick off, make mad, whatever else, I'm going to argue with them, and I'm going to, I'm going to be Jesus, but I'm going to do it with, a, with a, oftentimes a mean spirit. And then we go to the other extreme, which is, you know what? Being a Christian, nobody likes Christians anymore. Being a Christian is, is, is not real popular anymore, especially whether it's in the workplace or at the school or wherever else. You know, being a Christian is not very popular. Therefore, I take my Christianity and I fold it up neatly inside my pocket. And I just try to get along with everybody. Oftentimes, these are the two extremes. We talk a lot here at Frontline Bible Church about this thing called the messy middle. The messy middle. And the messy middle is where we're saying, I'm not going to choose either extreme. I'm going to seek to be Jesus, to represent him as best as I can, with all the strength and the wisdom that he can provide, knowing full well, though, that there will be those in this camp who say that I'm compromised. And then there will be those in this camp who say, why are you being so judgmental as a Christian? It's important that we seek to live in the messy middle, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And so the first thing, the first thing we need to remember is this. Remember that we serve a great God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. So once again, he asked that question. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? If you want to do good, if you want to be the Christian, if you're trying to do this, who in the world is going to harm you? In fact, they're going to be blown away by your Christianity and say, this is awesome, I want what you have. Well, there is a chance The way the text is written here, it's written as if to say, it's not likely that you will suffer for being a Christian. In fact, like he says, most people will be attracted to a true Christian life. But he puts the option out there because even those who were seeking to live just like Jesus in the world, they were still dying in the arenas as gladiator in the gladiator games. They were still being persecuted. They were still being harassed. They were still being put in prison. All these things were still happening to them even though they were seeking to be a a, a strong, faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And so he needs to prep them a little bit. And so this is what he says. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. You're blessed simply because you know Jesus. You're blessed because of eternal life. You're blessed for all the things. In fact, Paul tells us we have all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. We are blessed simply because we know him. But here's something else that we are blessed with. And he says this, do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Now, what Peter is doing is he's quoting from the Old Testament. He's writing to Jews. Okay, Peter is writing to Jews who were living in and around what would be modern-day Turkey today in a place called Asia Minor. And these were real churches in real cities, real towns, in a real place at a real time. And so he's writing to these real people to encourage them. But these would be good Jews, and they would know their Bible, and they would know their Old Testament. They would certainly know the prophets like Isaiah. So I want you to keep your finger here and turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, please. Isaiah is a really big book, kind of in the middle of your Bible. Isaiah chapter 8. There was a people group by the name of the Assyrians, and the Assyrians were a vicious, vicious group of people. I mean, they, they, they took, uh, you know, uh, warfare, and they put it to a whole new level. And one of the things that the Assyrians loved to do is they would take and conquer their peoples. Sometimes they would kill them. Other times they would put them alive, and they would put them on poles. They would impale them on poles around the city. They would go to a city because anybody who walked by, they, the Assyrians wanted them to know, this is what happens if you stand up against us. 
We are here and we will win and we will conquer you. And that's what they were doing. They were conquering, 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 conquering. And they came to the northern tribes. They came to the north, northern part of Israel, and sure enough, they conquered them. And then they were on the doorstep of the southern tribes. They're down near Jerusalem. And there was a king by the name of Hezekiah, and he was worried, and he was wondering, what's going to happen? Are we going to be able to handle this? And the people were getting freaked out because he was there. They knew he was coming. And so Isaiah receives a word back from God. And this is what he says there in verse, well, we'll start in verse 11. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people because the people were all abandoning God thinking, let's just give up being a God follower. Let's just turn over to the Assyrians. Let's do it this way. And Isaiah says, no, God has spoken. Then he says this. He said, do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. I think that that would suit our culture very well today as well. But we're not going to preach on that. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. We turn on the news, and we see the evils that exist in the world. Boy, we don't have to turn the news on. All you have to do is go on your Facebook page or your Instagram page. All you have to do is talk to your friends. All you have to do is be anywhere in the world. And you realize it's a world that seems to be going downhill pretty fast. And it can feel overwhelming, and it can feel like we're on the defensive, doesn't it? It can feel like there's so many forces out there that are against us, and boy, what do we have? We're like the little bitty tiny Christians against this great big world that seems to not care at all about what church and Christianity means, and we feel like we're the underdog. We can feel that way. And that's what was going on back here in Israel. You had this little bitty tiny Israel against this great big superpower, the Assyrians. And what was Isaiah, what did he tell the people? He says, don't fear what they fear. You see, they will fear things like death and they will fear things like other opposing armies and they will fear all those sort of things. But you know who's on our side? It is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts, that's the name. It says the Lord Almighty is his name. That word, the Lord Almighty is his name, is translated the Lord of hosts, which means he is the Lord of all the armies of heaven. It is God with all the armies of heaven, and he's on your team. How big does that army seem now? Seems way less in comparison. Think about it like this. When you are saying, I'm going to live as a Christian, I'm going to say, you know what, God, I do believe you're real. I believe you exist. I believe you made a way for me to, to have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm going to trust you. I am now saying, you are the one that I serve because you are the greatest of all. And all you have to do is look around the world and you can realize the heavens, Romans 1 tells us, declare the glories of God. All you have to do is walk out, look at a tree, look at a star in the night sky, look at the sun that's out there, look how everything functions, look at your own body, look at your hands, so for some of you can even still do this, maybe arthritis hasn't taken over yet, just to be able to move your fingers, all the things that you have, the fact that right now your heart is beating and you are not thinking one iota about keeping it there. All the processes that are happening, how your blood is translating oxygen and is doing, or the lungs are turning the oxygen, these carbon dioxide to oxygen so that your blood has it to pump through your body. And you are not worried at all. And do you know who created it all? It is the God that we serve. And so we look around at the world and we see just how, is, is it a powerful force out there? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But the the, the truth of the matter is, we serve a great God, which is why, if we go back to 1 Peter, Peter pulls from the Old Testament and he says, do not fear what they fear, do not be frightened. Now think about it like this, you're being hauled into the gladiator games, you're looking there at a lion that's on the other side of that gate. And unless God intervenes, that gate's going up. And guess what? You're the lunch. 
How many of you would be scared? I know I would be. The truth is, though, what he says is no matter what happens, your eternity is secure. The person who doesn't know Jesus, this is the best life they will ever have. For those of us who know Jesus, this is the worst life we will ever have. That's the God that we serve. And so he reminds them, yes, I know. Who's going to harm you if you're going to do good? Most people will not. But just in case they hate you, why? Because they hate me. Remember, we don't have to fear what they fear. We don't have to dread what they dread. Why? Because we serve a great God. Therefore, he goes on to say, But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. There's a lot of people, a lot of Christians, probably you. It was me for a time in my life. I was back in my teenage years. And it wasn't until I was 19 that I finally, I believe, made the difference between saying, Jesus, you are my Savior. I believed he had died on the cross for my sins. And he he was buried and he rose again. And I knew I had eternal life. But I was still living for John Louder. And I kept God. I kept Jesus in my pocket because I knew I had him. But I lived for me. And it wasn't until I was 19 that I finally came to a place in which I said, okay, God, that's it. I'm now willing to make you my Lord. It's no longer me telling you what I'm going to do. I am now arranging myself and I'm moving you to your rightful place. You see, God protects us. Not when we're out here doing our own thing. But he protects us as we place ourselves under him. If we set apart Christ as Lord, he will protect you. It doesn't mean you will not suffer. It doesn't mean you may not die. But no matter what, he is the one going in front of us. Why? Because he is the God of the heavenly armies. He is the one who's taking charge. And he will lead you and he will love you and he will guide you and he will comfort you. He will give you all the things that the world is desperately wanting but cannot have. We need to remember, in our plans as we say, okay, I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to do this, I'm going to live this way in my home and in the workplace and in my school and at my, wherever it is in the neighborhood, wherever, I'm going to be this way. I need to be prepared. When people don't like it, I remember, I serve a great big God. I'm not here to be say I'm against you because you don't, but just remember, my first allegiance is to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the God that I serve. That's the first Thing that we need to remember. The second thing is this. We have a defensible hope. I've appreciated Will, Pastor Will, as he's been doing his class on apologetics. And the word, the word apologetics is actually from this passage here. If you can turn, if it's following right along there. Always be prepared. Okay, that's right after in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Okay? The passage speaks about making an apology, an apologetic. It's actually the Greek word apologia. And, and that's the word for give a defense, to have a defense. Peter says, listen, we have a hope. We talk about it all year long. That's what we do. Every time we come and we sing about what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he has done for us, we remind ourselves that my hope, my identity, everything that I have, my victory is secure. Why? Because I know Jesus as my Savior. That's what I have. I have a hope that trans, trans, uh, transcends anything that may happen in this world. That's the hope that I have. But the truth is, it's actually defensible. It's actually defensible. Because it says, we, it says, we need to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason. Now, first of all, it needs this. We need to live like we have hope. I think that's one of the prerequisites. If my life looks no different, if my looks, life looks no different, and how it can be is no different is I can either be on this extreme. Remember, this extreme is the person who is, who is trying to fight everybody, You know, this is the person that's shouting at everybody on the street corner, you're going to burn if you don't know Jesus. That's good news, isn't it? You know, whatever else. That's this guy or girl over here. But then the other person over here, my life looks absolutely no different whatsoever from anybody else's. 
I'm just as anxious, just as depressed, just as worried about everything else in the world. My life, I'm, I'm doing the same habits, the same whatever as all my non-Christian friends, non-church friends. My life looks no different. Who in the world is going to look to you and go, wow, you got hope. Let me talk to you. This person who says, I'm going to choose to live in the messy middle. I'm going to choose to be the person who says, God, <clears throat> I don't want to be this. I don't want to be that, that battering ram with the Bible. But I also want to not be this person here. I want to say this. And Lord, give me the words to say. Give me the hope that I need to have. The gospel is truly good news. Because the gospel doesn't just give you an eternity in heaven. It doesn't just get you into heaven someday. The gospel truly does transform your addictions. The gospel transforms your habits. It transforms your thoughts. It transforms your, your desires. The gospel transforms all those things as we begin to understand who Jesus is and how he wants to live his life in you and through you. That's the hope of the gospel. It will make you more lovable. It will give you, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience. When you surrender to your life to the Spirit and stop trying to say, God, I'm the Lord, do what I say. And you say, God, I submit myself to you. It is then that the Holy Spirit gives us true love, even to the unlovable. Gives us joy, even though we're facing despair. Gives us peace and patience and self-control and all those things. That's the true hope of the gospel. And it's defensible. Why? Because the living God is inside of us. It is a defensible hope. And, and if you're struggling to know how to respond and how to do those things, I encourage you to attend Will's class. It meets there at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. There's a lot of great resources out there that can help you understand how to answer the questions. But this is one of the things. There are answers to the questions the world is asking. Now, just because there are answers doesn't mean the world wants them. But there are answers. But here's something very important. Given, given, uh, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Have you ever met somebody that just wants to tear you down? They don't care whether you're good or not. They just want to tear you down. And the reason oftentimes why is because they don't like who you are or who you represent. I remember when I moved down south. So I was born in Wisconsin. I moved down south when I was seven years old. I had no idea that there was a north and a south in America. But I moved down south. And while I lived down south, I lived in a great place, wonderful people. But for many years, I was this repulsive person called a Yankee. I don't know how many of you are aware that uh, if you live up here, you're Yankees, okay? Down south, the south is going to rise again in certain places. You just know that south is going to rise again, okay? But I, I was a Yankee down in the south. And for the longest time, I was simply treated like a Yankee. Didn't matter what I said, even though I did say weird things like the roof. Now, if you've lived in the south, you realize it's not a roof. What is it in, when you live in the south? It is a... It's a roof. It's not a roof. Crazy northerners say roof, you know, but no, it's a, it's a roof. It's those things we say wrong things, we do those sort of things, and, and, and actually we're certain we're rejected simply because of who I am, because of who I was. And I had to learn, okay, yes, I understand I'm not a southerner yet. I now say I'm a southerner at heart because I did live a lot of my life down there. I'm a southerner at heart. But I, I had to do so with gentleness and respect. And that's just a kind of a fun illustration of it. It's way more important when it comes to living as a Christian. It's way more important. Some of you are, I, I love Will's word in this class, some of you are just disagreeable. You like disagreeing with people. You like picking fights with people. You like being the one that says, oh, you know what, I, I got an argument to convince you, and so you go out there with your checklist, and I got, I'm going to pin you to the ground, right? That's who you are. But for most of us, we're not that way. And the thought of trying to have some arm wrestling match with a non-Christian or something kind of makes us a little weary. Until we realize that have you ever thought about it, 
Your life is the best witness you have. And when you go to somebody and you simply live differently, and you're living with hope, and even when they're coming at you, and even when they're poking you in the chest, maybe figuratively or literally, even when they're doing this, you still respond with grace, and you still respond with love. Trust me, it will sink in. And as you live with that gentleness and that respect for people, even though you may disagree with them, you still respect them and you still love them, even though you don't agree. There is something irresistible about that. And it may not change right away. It may be years before it changes. But that's what we are required to do. But knowing we do have an answer. And the answer is Jesus Christ. And then the last one. Oh, you know what? No, I... I, I, I do want to read this. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn there, please. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Paul talks about the, the sufferings that he had to undergo, but then he says this. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you want to live a godly life, if you want to live as a Christian in this world, expect persecution. Now, in this world, it probably isn't going to come in the area of peer pressure. Probably in America, it's going to come mostly in the area of peer pressure. If you go to your school, if you go to your workplace, if you go into your neighborhood, whatever else, and you say, I'm going to truly live as the Bible says, not just with all the things you can't do, but even with things like brotherly love and compassion and humility, all that stuff. When you say, I'm going to live like that, expect to be persecuted. Why? Because it says, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I love this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship or suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. You know, when I read that section, what it reminds me of, this is who we will continue to be at Frontline Bible Church as long as I'm the pastor here. Amen. We will continue to preach the word. There will be those, probably even within this fellowship, who will want us to water it down just to be nice. Who will want us to say, you know what, come on, we're going to attract a lot more people if we just don't take such strong positions on certain things. Trust me, as long as I'm the pastor here, that will not be who we are. Amen. We will live in such a way that we want to represent Christ just as he was. But we will teach in such a way that says, this is truth. And if I have to adjust, if we have to adjust, we will adjust to what the Word of God says rather than what the world is telling us we have to do. Right. We have a defensible hope. But it's hopeful. and We can defend it. The last one is this. Jesus has already won. Amen. Jesus has already won. If you want to turn back to 1 Peter chapter 3. Oh, man. By the way, I have enough notes here that we could talk for the next hour or two on this particular section. But we're not, we're not. I know your bellies are going to say like, oh, I'm done listening here. Anyway, um, 1 Peter chapter 2. By the way, I consulted a lot of different commentaries and a lot of different things. And there's a lot of disagreement out there about what these things actually mean. So we're going to go through it. And I'm going to give you my best interpretation. And someday you'll find out that I was right. But... <laughs> Someday you will, but, but it's just going to, honestly, I, I say that facetiously. There's a lot of really smart people who see things differently, but this is what, as, as I've boiled it down, I think this is what the passage is teaching. But I think, if I, if I hope you don't get anything else, you may hear about the Nephilim and, and baptismal regeneration, be like, what is going on? I want you to remember this, Jesus has already won. 
That's what I want you to remember, okay? Okay, that's what I want you to remember. So now let's dive into this. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. But I don't want to suffer. But Peter says, well, you know what? You may suffer anyway, whether you like it or not. But it's better to suffer doing the will of God than it is not to. And then he gives a couple of examples of those who are suffering without doing the will of God. And it's bad. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Man, there is so much in there I wish I could say. But the idea, I, I love, the, I love the, par, the, the, you know, the, word, the paradox here. Here you have our unrighteousness, and we can't do anything about it. And Jesus is righteous, and he doesn't need us. But he says, I will be their unrighteous. I will take their sin on myself to die for them. I die the righteous for the unrighteous. And that's what we celebrate in the hope of the gospel. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? I want you to hear this. To bring you to God. God is crazy about you. And maybe you need to hear that this morning. God is crazy about you. No matter what you've done, no matter who you think you are, no matter how much you think your life is hated by God, whatever else, God is crazy about you. And you know how he made it possible? By Jesus dying for all your sins, past, present, and future, so that you could have a relationship with him. The righteous for the unrighteous. That's what God has done. And so then he goes on. He says, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. I, I want you to notice if you have your uh, maybe like an NIV Bible or one of those, there's a, there's a variant here, a little footnote probably in your text. Made alive by the Spirit. The way the verse reads in the NIV, the New International Version, is that, that Jesus was put to death in the body, but the Spirit made him alive, which we understand to be true from other passages, but I don't think that's what this passage is getting at. I think what this passage is getting at is Jesus died... But he was still alive in the spirit. We understand that, okay? Because Jesus, after he died, did something that was really important. Through whom he also, he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Stop. Through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, Who are the spirits in prison? And why is Jesus going to preach to them? There are people who believe that this is a reference to those who have died before, believers, unbelievers, whatever else, and they died. Okay, so when you die, you know, your body goes in the ground, but you're still there. Prior to the cross, prior to the resurrection, People couldn't be in heaven, so they were in a place called paradise, which was in this place of the dead. It was two sides to paradise. You had Hades, Hades, the place of the dead. You had the good side, which was known as paradise, or Abraham's bosom, if you like that. Then on the other side, it was what we refer to as hell. It was the the, the bad side, okay? So you had two sides. There are those who say, okay, what Jesus did was he went and he preached to these people... And they say, oh, by doing that, he was telling them the good news of the gospel. The belief is that if he did that, well, maybe they get a second chance. Was Jesus preaching to the dead who had not received Christ or had not had any belief in him? Because remember, this was Old Testament. Is that who he was preaching to? I don't believe that's the case. I believe what Jesus did was when Jesus went down, and it's all in the Greek word there for preached. The usual word for preach, when we think about preaching the good news, it's the word euangelion, which means to proclaim the good news. That's what it is, euangelion, okay? It's from which we get our our English word evangelist. It's 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 the proclamation of good news. That's not the word used here. The word used here is simply the word keruso. Now, I I love this word, and I want to read the definition. I love this. To be a herald. So, I got news to proclaim, right? To officiate as a herald always with the suggestion of formality, gravity, and an authority which must be listened to and obeyed. So, I have formality, there is gravity, and I have authority, and you better listen. 
Why do we say this? Because, and man, my time is flying here. The reason why we say this is because he references the whole thing about who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Wait, wait, wait a second here. I believe what this is getting at is these are simply, these are spirits, these are angelic beings, fallen angels, these are fallen angelic beings, and when, what was happening during the days of Noah? It says the sons of God were marrying with the daughters of men, and they were creating this problem race, all I guess you'd almost say, known as the Nephilim. Now, there's difference of opinions as who the Nephilim really are, but I think what we're looking at here is you're looking at this aberration. And you had these, these demonic whatever, and they were, I believe they were inhabiting real people, creating a, 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 a problem, a, 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 almost a superhuman, and this because they were inhabiting, they could procreate, which created this race called the giants. The Nephilim, that's the word Nephilim means giant. And so we see this as it's beginning to do this. And God says, he looks down and he sees that the wickedness of people had gone so far. And God says, that's it. I'm judging the whole world. In fact, the text goes on to say, while God waited patiently during the days of Noah, while the ark was being built in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. We'll stop there for just a second. So what's going on? You have these spirits who had gone beyond what they were allowed to do. And God says, I'm done with you. And so he takes these spirits who had inhabited these men to create these Nephilim. And he takes them and he binds them. And 2 Peter chapter 2 tells us about this. Where it says he binds them and he puts them in a place called Tartarus. Now Tartarus, maybe you've heard that from other whatever stuff. Tartarus is a place within the abyss. It is a place, it is a section of what we, what we would call hell where these spirits were bound. You know what Jesus did when he died on the cross? It says in his body, he died. In his body, he died. But in his spirit, he went on a preaching mission. And he went down, and while there, he preached with all the authority and, the, and all the gravity that he has that says, you thought you had me. The devil thought he had me, but you didn't. Why? Oh, sure, you killed me on the cross, but guess what? I'm still alive, and I'm coming back. And so what he did was he went there to these spirits. You see, the devil has been trying since day one to thwart, to stop the plan of God. He's been doing it since day one. Since the Garden of Eden. Remember when, when the devil went to Adam and Eve and said, Oh Adam, oh Adam and Eve, you can do this. Why? Because God had a plan and he was working it out. And the devil thought, if I can just get Adam and Eve to believe what I do, to follow me, God is stuck. Well, guess what? God says, I'm going to make a way anyway. And then the Nephilim, then the sons of God come and inhabit the, the, the thing and they create this race. And God says, I'm not done yet. I'm still going to save you through, the Noah, through Noah and the ark. I'm not done with you yet. And then he goes along and now he proclaims, you know, that through Abraham there's going to be a descendant who's going to rule on, over the people. And he's going to be the king. And how many times did the devil all through the years try to get rid of the nation of Israel? Try to get rid of Jesus? Remember one of the most recent ones was Herod. Remember when he tried to kill Jesus when he was born? So many times the devil says, I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. And God goes, no you don't. And this was that final thing Remember when Jesus was on the cross and he said three words. He said a lot of words, but there were three words that he said at the very end. Do you remember what he said? He said the words, it is finished. Why did he say that? Because all of the sins were now paid for and he wasn't going to stay dead. You see, Jesus has already won. There are going to be people out there who will reject Jesus because they say, ah, I don't believe he's real. You know what? I don't even believe God is real. Most often, oftentimes it comes back to say, I don't believe he's real because if I follow Jesus, he's going to cramp my lifestyle. And so they say, I'm going to choose not to believe in him. I'm going to choose not to do these things because if I believe, 
I may have to change myself, and I don't want to change. Therefore, I don't believe he's real. And the world can make it look really convincing that, 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 that they are the stronger one. And the truth of the matter is, no matter what, they've already lost. And there's a day coming when Jesus is going to make it all right. When we are raptured out, and it will be right. And we're going to see heaven for all that it is. We're going to look back and go, man, this world, yes, it was bad. But it was so worth it. And there's a day coming when God is going to judge all those who shake their fist at him and say, I don't care who you are. I don't even believe you're real. Whatever else. Because Jesus has already won. It's just not been experienced yet for them. There's so much more to talk about here. My goodness, so much more. But I'm going to leave it at this. Be prepared to keep living as a Christian. You better be prepared. If you're not prepared, it's going to catch you unawares. It truly is. Remember that we serve a great God. God is far bigger than any other challenges and things that we face. He is far bigger. He is big enough for your greatest problem. He's far bigger than your spouse or your child or your fellow student or your coworker or whatever else. He is far bigger. Don't fear. Trust God. We certainly have a defensible hope. Learn the hope that you have. Understand the gospel. Come to know him even better because we can have a defensible hope in the world. And then the last one, Jesus has already won. Just remember that when you're facing those struggles, we serve a a Savior who's already won. And so here's your homework today. Your challenge is this. Don't back down this week from an opportunity to represent Christ with someone who is against him. Don't back down. It is very easy. It's very easy when somebody disagrees with you. It's very easy to want to just go along to get along. Don't back down. On the other hand, don't be this guy. Don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. Simply say, you know what, God? I'm going to trust you to help me to know how to live in this thing called the messy middle. Help me to represent you well. Help me just to live in such a way that maybe they will say, you're different. I want what you have. But don't back down and say, I'm not going to live like you. I choose to follow Christ and I will live like just, just like him. That's your challenge for the week. Can't wait to hear about it next week. I'm going to close in prayer. And then we've got some closing announcements here. So let's pray. Lord, it's, um, it's hard being a Christian. And, and really, I think we've seen so much, even within Christianity, a watering down of Christianity. Uh, as, as many Christians have become very progressive in their faith, and, and they're denying even things as, as basic as, as your deity. And, and, and the desire is simply just to go along to get along. It's just to be liked by people. And God, nobody wants to be not liked. But on the other hand, you are our Lord. You're not just our Savior, you are our Lord. And and the reason why you're our Lord is because you deserve to be. You are the great God. You are the one who created everything. And it is to you that one day we will answer. And so God, I just ask that you will take our feeble courage at times, our, our feeble attempts at offering hope that we have. May you take those things and really, through your spirit, work them out in such a way that we are willing to, to stand up for you whether that is standing in love or whether that is standing firm on truth. May we have the courage to do so and the wisdom to do it. So I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the encouragement of Peter. This world needs to see Christians. May we be those this week. In Jesus' name we pray. And all those in agreement said, amen.